Well, today I'm going to be talking about faith. And I don't think I can really talk about faith without sharing a story, um, really an encounter that happened a few years ago. And um, this was really an unexpected experience that I think helped to strengthen my personal faith. Some of you have heard this story before, so I'm going to give you kind of the condensed version. So about five years ago, not too long before becoming a pastor, I was really uh, struggling. I was irritable, agitated, angry, fearful. And, And I guess what really bothered me the most is that I couldn't really figure out why I was feeling so disturbed. Have you ever had something like that? You got something wrong internally, you just can't pinpoint what it is exactly. And and I was trying to figure it out. You know, my kids were healthy, my marriage was secure, my job was stable. What could be bothering me? Well, I became so restless that Megan had finally had enough, and she said, Chris, why don't you go and, you know, get away for a couple days? You know, just go off by yourself. You can rest and pray and kind of reconnect with God. Now, I want you to know that her suggestion was completely foreign to me. You know, get away by myself. We don't do that. I, I don't do that. You know, there's, there's far, much, far too much to do. Hotels cost money. And, and besides, I don't want to be alone with myself, with these feelings. I want to be distracted from them, if anything. You know, going off by myself sounded miserable because I knew that I would make for miserable company. So I resisted. In fact, I said, no, I'm not going. Well, then Megan said something very wise. She said, you are going. (laughs) I've already booked you two nights at Country Lake Christian Retreat. Now go pack your bag. And I was like, well, (laughs) you know, this is different from you. She's usually so submissive. Now, I I could have argued and resisted more, but I know my wife and I know that I had been beaten. Now, the rest of the story, I really struggle to put into words because I cannot adequately convey this event to you because it was so life-changing and moving. And it started with the drive there. To say that I had a feeling of dread was an understatement. The best way to describe what I was feeling on the drive there would be for you to just think about the most terrible conversation you've ever had to have. You know, think about conversation you had to have with your spouse or your boss or a very close friend You didn't want to have it, but you had no choice. And that's the feeling I had on that drive, just dread. And and I was nervous, too. So I checked in. I went to my room, and immediately God starts talking to me. Not audibly, but still with a very clear message. And here's what he said. He said, Chris, you are are not trusting me. You don't trust me. You say that you're my follower, but you don't even trust me. And over the next few hours, I laid in that bed at Country Lake, sobbing. God showed me one area after another where my my trust was lacking. I didn't trust God with my kids. And so I was always scared that they were going to get hurt or, or sick I didn't trust him with with my finances. And so I was always scared that we weren't going to have enough money. I didn't believe him. I didn't believe him enough to know that I could pastor this church. And so I was always filled with doubt. And the most painful thing that God pointed out is that I didn't trust him enough to confess some of, my, some of my sins and temptations to other Christians. I expected other Christians to do that, but I wouldn't do it myself. And so I always felt like a hypocrite. And for two days, I don't think I left that room as I wrestled with God about what it means to trust him. And at some point, 
I started to fill up this spiral notebook with verses, and they were all about trust. Verses like Psalm 27, verse 8. The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me, and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him, and he will act. Isaiah 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord is my strength and my song. Jeremiah 17, 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, you know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Psalm 9, 10, those who know your name trust you because you have not abandoned any who seek you. Now, trust. Trust is very important to God. It's the main ingredient of faith. And faith is essential to every Christian. In fact, you cannot be a Christian without faith. We just read last week in Romans 3, 8, that we are saved through faith. But what is faith? What is it? Well, I think there's a lot of confusion about what it means to put your your faith in, in Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of people out there and some in the church who think that if you believe in Jesus, then poof, you're saved. You're a Christian. So I just want to be very clear. Belief is also an essential ingredient to the Christian faith. After all, Jesus, Jesus told a Pharisee named Nicodemus, That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And the apostle Paul told the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And the book of Romans says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that you will be saved. But is believing, is believing really all that's needed to have a saving faith in Jesus? Well, really, I guess it depends on how you define belief. You see, I can believe intellectually that that stool over there will hold my body weight. But unless I'm willing to sit on it, my belief will always just be an intellectual belief. And intellectual belief is not enough. If I truly believe that stool will hold me, I will trust it enough to go and sit down on it. And when Jesus called Nicodemus to believe in him, it required more than an intellectual belief. He was calling Nicodemus to be born again, to begin an entirely new life devoted to trusting and following him. And when the Philippian jailer believed in Christ, he knew that he was going to join a community of Christians who were being beaten and imprisoned, persecuted for their faith. And so the Christian faith is more than just intellectual belief. And we can be sure of that because the book of James tells us in chapter 2, verse 19, that you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. One Bible teacher pointed out that demons have, have more faith than some people who call themselves Christians because at least the demons fear God. They know the truth and they fear it because how many times did a fearful demon say to Jesus things like, what do you want from us? Or we know who you are. You're the Holy One. Even the demons believed intellectually and they trembled. James says, you believe in God. Congratulations. You're on the same spiritual level as a demon. Intellectual belief in Jesus does not mean that you have a saving faith in Jesus. You can have an understanding and respect for Jesus without trusting him and without ever surrendering to him. I heard it said that many people believe in Jesus the same way that they believe in George Washington. He's a respectable historical figure And they know many of Jesus' teachings, and they agree that Jesus did great things, but they haven't trusted Jesus with their lives. They haven't really surrendered to him. 
You know, it wasn't too long ago that we completed a sermon series through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And do you remember what Jesus said when he was surrounded by people who, who were referred to as Jesus' followers? Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will reply to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Pastor David Platt said that we are all prone to spiritual deception, every single one of us. When Jesus said those words in Matthew 7, David Platt said he's not talking about atheists, agnostics, pagans, and heretics. He's talking about good religious people, men and women associated with Jesus who assume that their eternity is safe and, one, and will one day be shocked to find that it is not. Though they professed belief in Jesus and even did all kinds of works in his name, they never truly knew or put their trust in him. And Bible, Bible teacher J. Vernon McGee he drove this point with a story in which the devil has a meeting with his demons to decide the best way to persuade men that they don't need God. But, but since they themselves believed in his existence, they wondered just how they should do this. One demon suggested that they tell people that Jesus Christ never really existed and that, that he was just fiction, Another demon suggested that they persuade men that everything ends at death. There's no, there's no need to worry about life after death because it doesn't exist. Finally, the most intelligent demon suggested that they tell everyone that there is a God, that there is Jesus Christ, and that believing in him saves. But all you have to do is profess an intellectual belief and then go on living in sin just as you always did. They decided that this was the best tactic, and that is the tactic that the devil still uses to this day. So, there's no question that there's more to faith than intellectual belief. So, what is faith? Well, it's an important question because it is by grace, through faith, that we are saved, and it's faith that sustains us in this old, crazy world. The writer of Hebrews says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the prophet Habakkuk said, the righteous will live by faith. And the apostle Paul said, we live by faith, not by sight. And so, yes, the Christian faith requires belief, but it also requires trust. The book of Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 1 defines faith this way. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. And so simply put, Christian faith is to live trusting in the Lord Jesus rather than ourselves. Maybe the simplest and best definition that I've ever heard is faith is acting as if God is telling the truth. Now today we continue in our sermon series to the book of Romans. And last week I read Romans 3.28 in which Paul says that a man is saved by faith apart from the law. Now, this would have been shocking to the Jewish mindset. The Jews at that time were, were counting on their nationality, their obedience to the law, even their circumcision to save them. And so Paul knew that, that his words would have been stunning when he told them that their works were not going to save them. Instead, faith would. He knew that this would be met with skepticism. And so he takes the entire fourth chapter of the book of Romans to prove his thesis. He uses Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, as the perfect example of a man who is saved by faith in God. Now, Abraham is mentioned way back in the book of Genesis. And when the Bible first introduces Abraham, he is already 75 years old. And Abraham's story gets really interesting really quickly. In Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, which it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. 
I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, I think it's clear from this scripture that God spoke to Abraham in an audible voice. And there was no doubt about what Abraham was supposed to do. God said, leave, move, get going, and I will show you where you are supposed to go. And I will bless you with many descendants. Now, that sounds very uncomplicated, but it was not an easy thing to do. Chapter 12, verse 4 of Genesis says that Abraham was 75 years old. His wife was 65. Now, that is not an easy age to be moving. And I know that's true because last year, me and Megan moved, and I thought I was going to die. Several times, I vowed while moving boxes into the house that I was moving into my final resting place. I'm not doing this again. Well, then Genesis 12, verse 5 says, they had taken all the possessions that they had accumulated. Now, can you imagine this scene of Abraham, 75, Sarah, 65, loading up all their stuff to head off to, well, they don't even know where they're going, (laughs) God said that he would show them the land. And so God is saying to Abraham, trust me. Now, I don't know about you, but even when I go on vacation, I want to know where I'm going. I want to know exactly when we are leaving. I want to know what route we're going to take to get there and when exactly we're going to be back home. I've heard it said that a typical father, the night before a vacation, will line up his family and say, tomorrow we are going on vacation. It is for rest and fun and relaxation. We will leave at 5 a.m. The gas tank will be full and your bladders are to be empty. Now there will come a time when the gas tank will be empty and only then can your bladders be full. And if, you're, and if they are full before then, May God help you. (laughs) We want everything to be mapped out and planned, even on vacation. But Abraham, you know, he took off, not knowing where he was going. So imagine the conversation he had with his neighbors before heading off. You ever think about that? He's all packed up. Neighbor asks, Abraham, what's going on? Well, we're moving. Neighbor says, why? What's wrong? Abraham says, nothing's wrong. We love it here. Well, then why are you moving? Because God said so. Neighbor says, well, where are you moving to? Abraham, we we don't know. God said he would show us. Neighbor is probably like, hmm. Now, that took faith, which is why the apostle Paul uses Abraham as this example of faith. Then we learn in Genesis 17 that God reminds Abraham that he's going to have descendants through his wife, Sarah. But by then, Abraham is 99 years old. Sarah was 89. Can you imagine if that happened today? Oh, the gossip at the nursing home. (laughs) Myrtle, you know she's pregnant. What? (laughs) The fight with Medicare to cover the birth. You know, I'm about half that age, and whenever Megan gets around that Rodriguez baby, I'm like, stop, we're not having any more. You kind of age out. But here they are, 99 and 89. But in Genesis uh, 17, verse 19, God says to Abraham, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. Now, why was Abraham's faith so important? Well, from Isaac would come Jacob, and from Jacob would come the 12 tribes of Israel, and from the 12 tribes of Israel would come Jesus, born from the tribe of Judah. Now, when you think about it, 
Isn't it really, really amazing that Abraham, who is the great, 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 not sure how many greats are in there, great, great grandfather of Jesus, was known for his faith. It's really cool when you think about it. I want you to listen closely to how the New Living Translation puts Romans verses 4, 16 through 25. It says, So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. This is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no hope, no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Now, I want to point out a few more things about Abraham. First, his faith in God was so strong that he trusted that God could do anything, even resurrect the dead, including bringing back to life Sarah's dead womb. He trusted that God could make things out of nothing, just as he did at the beginning of creation. He trusted God could do the impossible. That is a faith-filled person. We also know that Abraham's faith was so strong that it would risk everything to obey God. You know, I don't have time to tell the entire story, but there was a time when God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his beloved son, who was so miraculously conceived. Abraham obeys. You know, he doesn't argue or question or even delay. God gave the command for Abraham to take the life of his own son. And in Genesis 22, we read that early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, and headed out to climb the Mount Moriah where he was to sacrifice Isaac. Now, we might wonder, why in the world would God ask Abraham to do this? And how in the world could Abraham even consider doing such a thing? Well, it might help us to know that this whole event foreshadowed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For instance, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, isn't it interesting how God worded his instructions to Abraham? He says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, sacrifice him. Now, I think his wording is especially puzzling because Abraham had another son, Ishmael. So why is he calling Isaac his only son? Well, the Hebrew word for only is yahid, which means unique or special. And Isaac was his only son of promise. Of course, this foreshadows Jesus who we read about in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his special son of promise. Back in Genesis, we read that Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Contrast that with John 19, 17, where we read that Jesus carried the wooden cross to Calvary. Back in Genesis, we read that Isaac looked around and said, Father... Where is the lamb that we are to sacrifice? 
Isaac said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Contrast that with John chapter 1, verse 29, where we read about John the Baptist who sees Jesus walking to- toward him. And he says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Back in Genesis, we read that Abraham tells Isaac that God himself will provide the lamb. Contrast that with 1 Peter, where it says that Jesus is the lamb. He is the spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice. Lastly, Isaac was resurrected figuratively, but Jesus was resurrected bodily in reality. Hebrews 11.19 tells us that Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Then, of course, we read that Jesus died and was buried and, and was raised back to life on the third day, according to the scriptures. Isaac was, ra- was raised figuratively. Jesus was raised literally. I read this week that many Bible scholars also believe that Isaac would have been sacrificed near the exact same place that Jesus was crucified. And so there are many incredible parallels between Jesus and Isaac. But be that as it may, sometimes I read that story about Abraham being called to sacrifice Isaac, and I think, wow, that seems messed up. (laughs) That seems extreme. But I think maybe it had to be extreme because God's extreme instruction proved that Abraham had an extreme faith. And that, and that is why, to this day, we look to Abraham for what it means to be faith-filled. Abraham is the patriarch of faith and an ancestor of Jesus Christ in whom we are to place our faith. Romans 4 or 5 says, But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. And something that is repeated over and over again in the book of Romans is that we are saved by faith, not by performing works Faith is essential. Now, the good news is we don't have to live out a perfect faith to be saved. If you were to read Abraham's entire story, you would find that he had times of doubt that led to sin. Our faith is never going to be flawless, and that is completely okay. Faith can be far from perfect, but it should be grounded in trust in Jesus. Trust is essential to faith. So the question is, where is your trust? Where is your trust? Do you trust Jesus with your life? Have you trusted him enough to surrender to him? If you would like to do that this morning, I would love to talk to you. Let's stand and we're going to pray. Father, we know it instinctively that any good, authentic relationship requires trust. And we are thankful that you are trustworthy. You know, just in my short little lifetime, I have, I have heard probably hundreds of testimonies of how you have, you have worked in people's lives, you have saved people, transformed them, who, who put their trust in you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the example of them. And we also thank you for the example of Abraham, who trusted you enough to risk pretty much everything to follow you. May we have faith like that. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.